This is One on One. Dr. Maury Meneker, President, Hackensack Alliance Accountable Care Organization. Good to see you, doctor. Good to see you too, Steve. We were just saying before we got on the air that the term accountable care organization is not one, A, that rolls off the tongue easily, and B, is not understood by most. Go. Well, the accountable care organization is a mechanism of developing a care delivery system that is integrated. It's not really a new idea, but now it's taken shape with the changes in health care, health care reimbursement. It was really thought of initially in the Bush administration. That far back. That far back. And uh, unfortunately, they got sidetracked with a couple of wars um, mm -hmm. and never really got to deal with health care issues. But the concept here is that patients need to get care. It needs to be coordinated care. And it should not be either on a national level or on an insurance company level to make a determination what's appropriate and who should be taking care of them and how. So we're talking about getting groups of doctors together, giving them the responsibility for maintaining the patient's care, maintaining their health, being efficient, and then getting a fixed amount of money that the doctors decide how they divide up and get paid for the appropriate care. Not necessarily the volume, but the quality. Give us a concrete example of how this would work, doctor, in the patient's interest. Well, the whole idea is, for example, patient walks into my office and has a problem that requires certain diagnostic testing, CAT scan. Your expertise is? Internal medicine. Got it. Uh, so I send the patient for a CAT scan, get the results, review the case with them, uh, come up with a treatment plan, et cetera. <clears throat> Three days later, patient uh, is in a car accident, ends up in the hospital. Uh, in the emergency room, doctors say, we need to get a CAT scan. Hmm. Might not be related directly to what the patient has. It might not even have any problems related to the car accident, but they have no understanding that this was done three days ago and everything was normal and the patient was told that it was normal. So therefore, the unnecessary test goes on. A, patient gets more radiation. B, significant increased cost to the system, no increased benefit. By integrating the systems and having a system where information travels with the patient from doctor to doctor, from doctor to hospital, from hospital back to doctor, mm -hmm. improves patient care, cuts down on waste, improves efficiency. The other thing that's so interesting to me about this, doctor, is you have said that technology, if used in the right way, also has the potential to dramatically improve and increase doctor-patient communication in a way that will once again benefit the patient. Definitely. Example of that, I, I knew there's some sort of scale. Just give me the scale one. Okay, the scale one's an easy one. I like that one. Okay. Because I avoid my scale in the morning, go ahead. <laughs> one of our biggest problems is dealing with patients who have what's called congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is when the heart weakens and patients have a tendency to retain fluid, right. swell, gain weight. One of the best mechanisms for monitoring this is just checking their weight every day. Now, not only do the patients sometimes forget to check their weight, they don't necessarily see what the number is, they don't necessarily communicate it to the doctor. They go, oh yeah, I had too much to eat yesterday. They don't realize that it may be the beginnings of a problem. It matters. It matters. So, there are scales that are provided by certain medical companies that will send the weight directly to the doctor's office, directly to the electronic medical record on the computer. Hmm. If there's a significant difference from the day before, the doctor all of a sudden gets notified. Hmm. They don't even have to look at it. It comes to them saying, the patient gained two pounds. Doctor will tell his nurse, call the patient, let's get them in, as opposed to the patient waiting, not going to the doctor. Three days later, they're back in the hospital. Is that the same principle with the blood sugar same information? Thing. Explain exactly. that. Um, most diabetics have little machines that are called uh, uh, glucometers right. that they prick their finger, they get a blood sugar reading, they mark it down, and then when they go to visit the doctor, they bring in this sheet of three months worth of blood sugar testing. The doctor looks back and goes, oh, you know, two months ago we really should have made some changes. Patient doesn't know. These machines also have the capability 
okay, of sending this information directly to the doctor, directly to his electronic medical record. The doctor can actually just look at a flow sheet and see the daily blood sugars without even having to talk to the patient and then send a message to the patient, your blood sugars are fine, continue, or we need to make an adjustment, come on in, or have the nurse call and say, were they doing something different? Did something else happen to make these sugars get out of control? You know, as I'm listening to you, it strikes me that A, it, it has the potential to change doctor-patient communication dramatically, but also, it, it does it require the patient to be more engaged and involved in his or her treatment? Well, what we want is the patient to be more and more engaged. Or, or and excuse me, because if they're not going to be, we account for that because that information is going to be communicated anyway. Well, and it also, what happens is if they're not doing the test, the doctor also knows they're not doing the test. Because where's the information? Exactly. So therefore, uh, you know, it's a, it's a double check on the patient. How are your colleagues reacting to all this? Most. Most of my colleagues are very excited about these prospects and are looking forward to the changes. The, the frightening part is most doctors are still businessmen as well. They're still yeah, businessmen and women, right? And, and women. And therefore, there's always concern of, okay, who's going to pay for this? And how am I going to get paid? Because I'll tell you, today, uh, I can spend an hour on the phone with a patient, and the reimbursement from the quote-unquote insurance company is zero for that. Now, if I brought the patient into the hospital, the hospital would get paid a couple of thousand dollars from the insurance company. Which you're trying to keep the patient out of the hospital. Exactly. <laughs> it's... it's, it's that's why the reimbursement system has to change, and that's what the ACOs are trying to do, saying, listen, we don't want to get paid for putting people in a hospital. We want to get paid for keeping people healthy. It doesn't make a difference what we do to keep them healthy. As long as we keep them healthy, we're happy, we're doing our job, we get paid. Last question. You know what you know now about this fast changing, dramatically, um, changing landscape of healthcare, hospital, the physician side. If you knew, you know where I'm going, right? I think so. If you knew this back then, would you still have said, I'm going to do it? For me, the answer is yes. Because? It's a calling. It's something that you choose to do, not because of the reimbursement, not because of the hours, not because of the prestige, but because, you know, you've, you feel a need to be able to give back, to do something to help people. Is it a struggle sometimes when you're talking to others, you know, residents, others who are those potentially considering the medical field? Because they see the landscape now, but you know you need the best, the brightest, the most committed. Challenge, right? It's a challenge, but more importantly, the, the scary part is the cost these days. Um, for uh, a young person to go to college, we know what the costs are. Uh, you know, you're going to end up if you don't have rich parents, uh, loans $200,000, dollars double that for going to medical school, if not more. Then you have to go into training to learn, how, to learn your specialty, and you'll make enough money to get by, but you won't be paying anything back. So all of a sudden, you walk out as a doctor with $500,000 mm -hmm. over your head. So the question is, why would you want to go to a low-paying specialty, you're going to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I should do something that's, that I'll get paid more so I can pay my loans off faster. This is a problem that we have to deal with. Especially because we need more primary care physicians. Exactly. Dr. Maury Meneker, uh, president of Hackensack Alliance Accountable Care Organization. I want to thank you, and not just for being here, but for the calling that you've answered. Thank you, doctor. My pleasure. This is One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back right after this. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been provided by activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge, Choose New Jersey, NJIT, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, and by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.